Hello, here we are in Kent. We're about to look at a battle, which meant that we all didn't end up speaking German. But we're not talking about the Battle of Britain here. Oh no, we're gonna have to rewind to the fifth century. Welcome to Kentish Tales and Tales of Kent. In the 5th century, England had been merrily ensconced in the Roman Empire for several hundred years. Um, but things were changing. They were suffering at the hands of various invaders, and they asked the Emperor at the time, Honorius, uh, for some help. But he said, you will have to look to your own defences. So it's possible that the Roman legions left in around 410 AD. Um, but we're not sure. Lots of historians argue about this. Pictish raids were becoming particularly annoying. Uh, a cleric in the 6th century called Gildas said, They were like worms which in the heat of midday came forth from their holes and butchered our countrymen like sheep. Which is a whole lot of mixed metaphors there. Britain was also being invaded by German types, the Angles, the Saxons, the Jutes, raiding and pillaging. So they called on Aetius, who was the most important Roman commander at the time, and they said to him, the barbarians drive us to the sea, the sea drives us to the barbarians. Between these two means of death, we're either killed or drowned. He was having problems with a certain Attila the Hun, so he didn't send any help. So it was in 449 AD that Vortigern, who was a warlord in Britain, or possibly the king of all Britain, which seems a bit of a stretch, had a bit of a problem. He was beset by all these Picts, so what he decided to do was call on help from over the sea. He asked a group of Germanic types to come over and help him, and they arrived in free boats, according to Gildas, here at Ebbsfleet. Now, Bede, or the Venerable Bede, as you might know him, who was a Benedictine monk, he says in his 8th century account of what happened that the two people who led this expedition were two brothers called Hengist and Horsa, and they were related to Odin himself. The offer they gave Hengist and Horsa was that if they could help defeat the Picts, they would be granted small amounts of land in Kent. Here at Pegwell Bay, we can see a Viking ship. Now this one was rowed here in 1949, just after the Second World War, by some intrepid and brave Danish chaps. To commemorate the landing of Hengist and Horsa some 1500 years before. Uh, more confusingly, the actual boat itself is of a Viking design from the 9th century. Now we're not really sure, Hengist and Horsa, we kind of throw words around, are they Jutes, are they Angles, are they Saxons? Um, but what we do know is that Kent, uh, shortly after Hengist and Horsa's arrival, did begin to see burials which more resembled those from Denmark. They were more Jutish, if you will. So possibly Hengist and Horsa were more Danish. And Bede agrees with this, he says that the Isle of Wight and Kent were settled by the Jutes. As to whether they were Anglo-Saxons or Jutish, it doesn't really matter, uh, because you know the type. They were hairy, uh, they had helmets of a non-horned variety, and they were generally of a violent disposition. Hengist and Horsa and their Germanic chums quickly whipped the Picts and brought peace and happiness to Britain. Until that was, they said to Vortigern, this has gone so well, why don't we invite more of our friends over from across the sea? And Vortigern said, yes, that would be a great idea. What could possibly go wrong? Vortigern was so pleased with their work that he granted them some extra land. But he was being cunning because he said, I will grant you as much land as can be covered by an ox hide, which is not a lot. Um, Hengist, however, was much more smart for he cut the ox hide into lots of tiny, 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 tiny strips and laid out a massive area. And it was there that he built his castle. Now, some people say this was in Grimsby. Some people say this was in Lincolnshire, but it's quite clear that this was actually here in Kent at Tongue, which is an old word for strips of leather. Now, you might also cast aspersions on this story because you think if you're uh, a classicist, think, hang on, didn't Dido do a similar thing in Carthage? Possibly. Vortigern didn't seem to mind any of this cheek. In fact, he was there when they opened up the castle and they had a night of drunken revelry. And at the highlight of this meal, Hengist brought out his daughter called Rowena. And she was said to be very, very fair. 
and as Geoffrey of Monmouth said, it was at that point that the devil entered Vortigern's heart and he was seduced by Rowena. And he immediately divorced his wife, cast aside his children and wanted to marry Rowena. And Hengist said, I'm fine with that. I just like one small thing in return, Kent. Vortimer, who was uh, a child from Vortigern's first marriage, and Catagan, who was also uh, an offspring of his first marriage, assembled a mighty host to take on Hengist and Horsa. And they fought here at Ebsford, which we think is Aylesford, down there. Um, so uh, on one side, Hengist and Horsa with the Anglo-Saxons and the Jutes, maybe, uh, versus the Britons. And this is where it was fought, possibly. So during the mighty battle, Anglo-Saxons, Jutish types fighting the Britons, shields butting against each other, swords and spears jabbing. Catagan spied in the distance Horsa and rode to meet him. The two fought each other with blood spurting everywhere, cleaving at each other. And Catagan was slain, as was Horsa. Um, Catagan's body was brought here where they constructed a mighty tomb for him, and his body was laid to rest. That's not actually true, this is Neolithic, so this was around thousands of years before the battle. Um, the first person to make the connection, apparently, between the two was William, uh, William Lambard, who wrote his Perambulations of Kent, and he thought that this was Cadogan's tomb. Uh, we now know that's not the case. Still, it's a great story. So, the Germans were defeated, and it is said that their banner was laid upon this, the Upper Horse Stone. Perhaps even Horsa, his dead body, was laid out upon this mighty rock. Or not, because actually uh, this didn't used to be called the Upper Horse Stone. There was another uh, stone further that way, which was called the Horse Stone. Um, this is only recently, in the last hundred years or so, got that name. It does look a bit like a horse, though. And is is that the is that? like an eye and then yeah. there's like nose and things like that who knows obviously it's really easy to poo poo all of this and say that these stones have nothing to do with the Germanic hordes or the Battle of Aylesford or any kind of burial place but it's possible they might just have done because surely in those ancient battles people would have looked at these sites as a place of wonder and they might well have laid their banner here who knows and so it came to be that the angles or the saxons or the Jutes or whatever you want to call them were driven back here to ebbsfleet where they fought one final battle and they were driven into the sea and thus ended the time of Anglo-Saxon Britain, and that's why we all speak a kind of Welsh now. Well, obviously not, because what apparently happened was, according to Nennius, who was writing in the 9th century, what happened was that Vortimer died. According to Geoffrey Monmouth, who was writing much later in his History of the Kings of Britain, said that Rowena, the wife of Vortigern, poisoned Vortimer. And this would all have been fine because Vortimer said that as long as you bury my head at Richborough, for though he said they may inhabit other parts of Britain, yet if you follow my commands, they will never remain in this island. Apparently everyone ignored him and they buried him in Lincoln. In the ensuing hullabaloo, Vortigern apparently took the throne again um, and he invited Hengist back, having learnt nothing apparently. They came back to Britain, slew many English nobles and took over the country, possibly. Some people say that Hengist and Horsa never actually existed, and it was all a myth based around two ancient German gods. Or some people say that what happened was that the Anglo-Saxons came over, slew the Britons, and threw them to the corners of the kingdom in Cornwall, Wales, and Scotland. What we do know is that everyone ended up here speaking a kind of Germanic language, uh, this English tongue of ours, which doesn't explain in any way as to why I was very bad at German at school.
If you've enjoyed this video and would like to learn more, then why not click on the link below and you'll find a website with a whole reading list of topics. If you have any other places, people or time periods you'd like me to look at, then pop them in the comments below. Thank you very much for watching and stay tuned for more Kentish tales and tales of Kent.